So to introduce our musical talent for tonight, born and raised just three miles from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Nate and Lydia Briggs have been playing piano nonstop since the age of five. Both currently are members of the School of Rock Cleveland House Band who play regularly throughout Cleveland. Nate is a 2020 member of the School of Rock All-Stars, chosen as one of the best musicians out of School of Rock's 34,000 global network of students. Lydia is the proud owner of Gin House Records and belongs to the select, I guess I don't know what this acronym is, AWAL, AWAL Core Music Distribution Family. Maybe that's the, I guess she can tell us when she comes on. Um, her short career, six singles, has already garnered over 29,000 streams on Spotify and Apple Music and 308,000 views on YouTube. Her website will be in the chat, lydiabriggs.com, and I, actually, I asked her to put a link in there in case you want to um, tip her. And I have, I have an interesting, um, I kind of think in songs, that's how my mind works. And so I, had, I actually enjoyed picking the song that we'll do for our um, musical introduction of our speaker. So let me pin that, them to the, make them the spotlight. I think it's a spotlight video. I think that's the right one. So um, maybe I have to pin it. All right, so Lydia and Nate, uh, do your thing. On. Thank you very much for that really nice song. I appreciate that. I bet you've never been inter introduced by Jimi Hendrix before. 
No, nor a musical <laughs> introduction. So this is a first. I thank you for that experience. <laughs> All right. So let me go ahead and at least give your formal introduction, then you can take over. And I hope I, I hope I get your name right. That's okay. <laughs> Nicole Capuana. Is that close? Close. Very good. <laughs> Has been crafting innovative, impactful technology products for over 20 years, from ensuring household robots behave to helping people relocate across the globe. She has built a boutique software design and development consultancy on a boat, formed a startup where the team was awarded multiple patents, was a contributing author for a book on how modern software teams work together, coach product teams on how to deliver maximum business value and exceed user expectations, and she co-founded a nonprofit to get girls into tech. She is a national speaker on product design and an adjunct professor focused on digital innovation for Case Western Reserve University's eMBA program. All right, Nicole, thank you very much for coming tonight. I'm very excited to have you. Awesome, well, thank you for having me. So I guess um, let's get started here. Just first of all, thanks for having me uh, here tonight. Um, I think Kelly had uh, encountered me doing another talk and thought it was interesting and suggested I come and share some stuff with you all tonight. So today for me has been a giant blur and I ran out of, of time. Uh, so today's uh, presentation is a combination of some things I've talked about in the past. Um, so forgive me if I encounter something where I'm like, well, that's like a weird transition. Um, but I, I did my best to be able to come here tonight and I have about 53 slides. So it'll be a fire hose of information and then um, some questions. So tonight I'm here to talk about user experience and design thinking, give you a little taste of what it is. I'm sure it'll uh, provoke lots of questions. And if we run out of time today, I'm always happy to have a conversation afterwards, one-on-one uh, -on -one or with more of the group. So let's get started. Um, so this is me, Nicole Capuana. This is my fancy pants headshot. Um, I've been doing 20 years of designing software for both um, small companies and large companies. And um, I wasn't sure if Spike was going to go into my whole bio background. So I have another slide to tell you that I have worked for both large and small companies. I did build a design and development agency that is Lean Dog. Um, they are on the boat down by Berkeley Front Airport. Um, I ran my own independent consulting business. I co-founded a startup. I wrote a book, Lean Dog's Agile Discussion Guide. It's free. You can download it from leandog.com. I co-founded a nonprofit. And because I really love to have an insane schedule, I also teach uh, students in the digital innovations class at Case. Um, so my whole career has really been around designing software. Uh, it's been in the web. It's been in mobile, kiosk, the internet of things. Um, and these days I work at Progressive uh, in their new growth incubator. So the new growth incubator is called Level 20 and I can't talk a lot about what I'm working on, but I'm working on ideas that are for Progressive about like 10 years out, like 20 years out, what that future could be improving out if there's a market on those, those ideas. So my whole day-to-day -day world is really helping my team navigate through uncertainty, figure out if there's a product there, then define what it is that we're gonna build and test and experiment and learn and launch. So today in our time together, uh, which probably will feel like maybe not enough, I'm going to touch into what user experience is and what it's not. And I apologize because I have two dogs who are very large and sometimes they like to uh, make a lot of noise when I'm on video. So. If you hear background noise, that's what's going on. The other thing I'm gonna cover is a little bit into design thinking, how it works and why it unlocks creativity, and then give you some practical tips that I think you can use to make your work better uh, right away. So even if you don't do web design, these are things that can correlate to any sort of uh, communications that you might be designing or print work um, or just general uh, thoughtfulness around structuring an email. So user experience is um, often these days sort of in the digital realm and it has grown from uh, the earliest days when the internet launched uh, into what is now professionally called user experience but it was really around the design of information how things interacted together what things looked like and it it's uh, really been an emerging practice and uh, a really great uh, career path for many folks so i'm going to give you a little story to start us off that I think showcases user experience and the things that I have to consider as a designer. Um, so a few years ago, 
I was trying to go to a conference and I was flying from Cleveland to New York City and I'm packing out my bags ready to go to the airport and I get a phone call that tells me my flight is delayed. And so I was surprised. I was like, wow, that's really nice of United to call me and tell me that my flight's been delayed. And it was delayed long enough that it was like, there was no point of driving to the airport um, right then and there. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll pack my bags, I'll go home, I'll grab dinner, and then I'll head to the airport. Well, this automatic caller called me every five minutes for the next three hours to tell me that my flight had moved gates, it had moved times by a minute this way or that way. Literally the caller guy was now my new best friend calling me constantly. So I'm home and it calls back and at this time it tells me that my flight is canceled, which I'm upset about or bothered, right? Uh, but then in true fashion, he calls me back five minutes later to tell me I'm now on a new flight and that new flight leaves in 40 minutes and I live in Euclid and it's about 40 minutes to the airport, all said and done to get in. So I race to the airport, I get there, I walk in, and for those of you who've gone to Cleveland when the days of United with the giant bank of kiosks, there's some 40 kiosks there, um, I have to go up to one and get a boarding pass because I'm now on a new flight. And all of the kiosks are down. And so I can't physically print my boarding pass. The printed boarding pass I have before is no longer valid. So I try um, logging into my into the website. It can't. It doesn't recognize me. I see three people standing at the end of all the kiosks who look like they work for United Airlines, and I go up to them and I say, "Hey, can you help me?" And they say, "No, we're not on the clock." I was like, "Okay, great." So now I'm trying to again call uh, United Airlines on the phone, trying to log in at the same time. Nothing is working. All I need to do is getting board a boarding pass. My new plan is to go to TSA and beg and plead them to let me through with the old boarding pass. And as I walk past this giant bank of kiosks, I finally find one that looks like it might be operational. So I go up to it. I manage to get my new boarding pass. I manage to fly through TSA, get to the plane in the lick of time, and get on literally as they're closing the door. So the reason why I share this story is like, that was my user experience with United Airlines. I was just trying to get from Cleveland to New York and I managed to touch every, almost every single part of that organization from an experience perspective. Originally, I had bought my uh, tickets online, so I was interacting with the website. I had the interactive automatic caller guy call me. I had uh, a printed out a boarding pass. I tried to interact with kiosks. I tried to interact with the mobile site. I tried to call them from my phone. I tried to talk to people. All of those things go into United's experience design. And clearly in this example, there were many failures. Um, so as I work on building products, these are, the, these are the touch points and the moments we have to think about and orchestrate across the entire uh, delivering of that product or delivering of that service. So that's one story, just to paint a little picture about user experience. And I will tell you another little story. Um, and this is a story of 17 cents. So I had a moment where I was trying to buy icons online and I just wanted to pay $10 so I could buy 10 icons over time. And I keep trying to give the website uh, my credit card and it keeps failing. And I go like, I try to create an account and then give them money that way. I try to buy directly there and go through the shopping cart and nothing seems to be working. And then my phone rings and it's my bank. And they say, we suspect there's fraudulent activity happening on your account. And I was like, well, what's going on? They're like, someone's trying to buy icons at this icon site. I'm like, yes, that's me. And I want to give this company $10. And so while I was very pleased that the experience from KeyBank was that they called me because of this thing, I was less satisfied with the icon site where I was just trying to give them money. And I asked the KeyBank people just out of curiosity, what was the trigger that made them go, Hmm, something's going on here. And they said, the icon site first passed a transaction through for 17 cents. And that is highly suspicious activity where they ask for just a little bit of money before they go in and get the rest of it. And so as someone who designs systems, I'm like, that is poor programming. <laughs> that is poorly defined work that somebody didn't go in and clean up where I could see early on, you might just do a little bit to sort of test out your system as you're getting ready to launch. But that was like leftover bad code that was preventing people from buying icons from that site and causing unnecessarily marked fraudulent activity. So those are the details as a designer I have to worry about. Um, Oftentimes, UX is seen as just what things look like. And I like to use this chart to show you that oftentimes people 
I think it's just what it looks like, what the interface looks like, what the visual design is. It looks pretty. Can't tell you how many times people are like, oh, just come in and make it pretty. And really that's the last thing that I end up doing. It's all the stuff on the, the left where I have to go deep on understanding people. I'm doing experiments and I'm doing user tests and I'm considering the content and the strategy around that content. The words that I use, the way I lay out information so that there's a correct hierarchy and even making sure that that hierarchy is something that can be read by accessibility tools. So someone who might not be able to consume using just a regular browser, but may need to use a screen reader, those are all the things I need to consider in my job. It's not about just making things look good. So I'm pretty sure this has been all of you at some point, that you've sworn because something's frustrating, you feel that you can't figure it out, and you even walk away wondering if you actually did it correctly. Um, and so my job is to actually make all of that go away. And I say, if I do my job well, sometimes you never notice because it's just easy to use. You don't think about it. You come in, you do what you need to do, and you move on. And you have confidence that you did it correctly. So the good design is stepping back and starting with people. Because at the end of all the things that we build and we create, it's about helping people do something. It, you know, the, design, the designs I make are not for me. They're not for art. They're meant for people to be able to do, um, do certain things. So we have to step back and we have to understand those people so that we can design something that meets their needs. And we also have to have a problem we're solving. A couple of years ago, I had a client that came in and they wanted to build an app that would prevent people from tweeting while drunk. And I was like, you know, um, maybe some people in the world need that app. I'm not sure really a lot do. Um, is that really worth solving? Do you really want to spend $100,000 to build an app to prevent you and your brother from tweeting while drunk? Um, if you do, fine, we can do that. But let's be honest, like, let's step back and think about, is there really a problem that we could solve um, that is worth solving? So those go hand in hand. We have to understand the people and we've got to find a problem that's worth solving. And some of you may have heard of human-centered design. This is a term that's out there. Um, it's, again, just coming back to the people and relentlessly focusing on them to understand them so that you can make their lives better and meet their needs and understand the why behind their needs and their desires. And when we design, it's not about you or me. Uh, it's not what I like or what you like. We have to put ourselves in the mindset that we don't have the answers. We need to get out there and talk to the people who are going to be using our products or our services and understand what it is they need. So we have to set our preconceived notions aside and we go out there and we talk to people and we want to find out why they need what they need. If you go out and ask people what they want, they won't be able to tell you. Um, they may give you all sorts of crazy ideas, but it doesn't give you any real indication of if they need it and if they'll use it. And for many things, buy it right? Because at the end of the day, many of the things we're working on are businesses. So when you go out and you talk to people, which I get can maybe be, feel a little scary at first, um, it really is not. Um, many people will want to talk uh, and you want to reach out to the people who are using your product or could be using your product and get them to tell you stories. And you want to have them tell you stories about how they solve their their, their, um, their problems today, what those solutions look like. Um, is it really painful? Do they, um, you know, how, what, what do they need and why is that? And when you go talk to these people, you wanna ask open-ended questions and you want to say something like, tell me about the last time you did X, Y, or Z. When was the last time that happened? Can you tell me more about that? What was that like? Can you show me? Um, why was that? Like, how did you feel? And it's a sort of laddering of whys. It's not really you driving conversation. It's really listening into what they're saying and then being able to adapt and, and say, well, tell me a little bit more. And I'll give you a secret. As you talk to people and you um, want to get a little bit more out of them, if you purposely pause and are quiet for just, it'll feel like a long time, just a few seconds, People by nature will want to fill the void of silence, and that's oftentimes when people will tell you some really great gems. And when you go out and you talk to people, you want to avoid the woods, the W-O-U-L-Ds. Um, and that is because people will say one thing and do another. Um, and if, I, if you were to tell me, if you were to ask me, 
hey, Nicole, would you go running tonight? I'd say, sure, I would go running tonight because I'm a nice person and I'd like to go running. Uh, if you said, hey, Nicole, would you go do yoga tonight? I say, sure, I would go do yoga with you. Um, but if you learned that I actually haven't run since junior high school, um, and that was a long, long time ago, um, and you also learned that I've gone to yoga every week for the last 15 years, which one do you think I'm actually going to do? The chances are that I'll go do yoga first before I ever decide to like go for a run. So while people say they will do things, it doesn't necessarily mean they'll actually do them. So pay attention to avoid asking questions of would you, um, would you do this? Would you use this? And like I said, do versus say. People will say one thing because they want to be nice and they'll do another thing. And um, whenever you can, observing your users or your customers um, doing what it is that you're trying to solve um, will help you have much greater insight into what their needs are. They may, um, years ago I had a client who wanted to replace a call center system and when I went and I sat with every single call center rep, it was very interesting to see that they all, they had to send a lot of faxes, um, which I know is hard to believe these days, but they would get to a screen, they would put a, a number in and they would go to the next screen and they would delete the two numbers that were already there, go back a screen, copy the number they had just put in, come back to the next screen, paste it in and move on. And not one person did this, they all did this. And I asked them, why are you doing this? And they said, well, we don't trust that the numbers that are already here are actually gonna get this fax to the person and I'm sending sensitive health data and I wanna make sure that the person gets it. And the person just told me they're gonna be at this number. Now, had I gone to those call center people and said, how can I make this system better for you? What do you need? What do you want? They never would have said, hey, get rid of these two fax fields that are already pre-populated and pull this piece of information forward, right? I got to see it with my eyes. I witnessed it. I got to ask questions around why they were doing that and got to observe that it was taking, you know, extra time to go do this. So before we even replace that system, we removed those two pre-populated fax numbers and automatically pulled the fax number they entered in the prior screen forward which saved them 30 seconds per call, which equaled out to $120,000 worth of savings. Now, a small piece of change for uh, a, a big company, but still 120,000 could be two more call center people. It could be training. It could be like the starting of building the new system, right? But had I just asked them, they never would have said that. I had to see it. So just another powerful example of people doing one thing and saying another is they did a study a couple of years ago in uh, London and they stood outside of a public restroom and they asked people, did you wash your hands? And everyone of course said, of course I washed my hands. What the people didn't realize though is that they had cameras installed over the sinks recording what people actually did. So while 99% of them said they washed their hands, 32% of men actually did and 64% of women. So it's a powerful example. People will do one thing and say another. So watch them and observe them when you can. Um, and we do this by talking to people and observing them so that we can get insight and we can gain some empathy for these people. When I got to see those call center people repeatedly peeling off those two existing fax numbers, you know, like I had empathy. They was taking extra time. Like how awful was it that they just did this repetitive thing over and over again? Um, so that helps us create something that might be a better design for people. Um, we also test our designs. So in order to sort of achieve the um, you never know that I, I did my job because things are great is that we do a lot of testing and I encourage you because not many places maybe have the ability, ability to do massive scale testing or paid user research studies but you can certainly do what I call the Lisa test and Lisa was my accountant when I was at Lean Dog she was not very technical and what I would do is anytime I wanted to get some initial feedback as to whether this thing was understandable to a complete novice who had no idea what was going on, I would say, hey, Lisa, can you come down and try something out for me? And I'd have her go try to use whatever it is I was creating. In this particular example, I was, we were building a vending machine that wanted to replace the physical keypad with a digital um, sort of screen. And so I quickly just mocked up a paper prototype to scale, uh, measured it, taped it to the wall, put some candy in, and I said, okay, Lisa, you want the Snickers? How are you gonna get the Snickers? 
right? And then I could test out whether or not we needed the keypad physically, or if we needed to replace it with a digital keypad, or if what the client actually wanted, which was no key to, keypad entirely, if that was even acceptable when um, the user could see that in B4 was the Snickers, and then now they had to go through a screen by screen and go find it in these categories that maybe it's under nuts, maybe it's under chocolates, maybe it's under sweets, desserts, like snacks, um, and then find it and buy it that way. So my point is, is test, testing doesn't have to be overly complicated. Find, find your leases and test with them. I will caveat, you don't necessarily wanna test with friends and family because again, friends and family are really nice and they love you, right? And they'll tell you really great things and say, oh, this is great, I totally understand it, and they don't. Um, so find someone like Elisa who, yes, she was a, a friend because I worked with her, but I knew like she wasn't as friendly as like going to my mother and asking her to try to do this. Um, and if you test with five or eight people, again, you don't have to ton, test with a ton of people, but if you test with five or eight people, you're going to find most of your usability issues where things aren't clear or a label is confusing or they can't find the button to continue or they didn't read the giant message that's in, in the middle of the screen. Um, all of those things can get surfaced by just testing with a handful of people. So five to eight is usually the sweet spot. Um, most of my time these days, I test every month uh, with at least five people. Very rarely at this stage of my development for my product do I go beyond that, but certainly in the early days where things were a lot more amorphous uh, and murky, we tested with lots of people and we were doing lots of interviews and, and all sorts of experiments all at once. So, so simple, right? Um, many of you probably can appreciate this, right? Like simple is not easy. Um, we all strive to have something that's designed simply. simply but it takes a lot of iterations to sort of balance that elegance and the clarity and the intuitiveness. And the very first thing I ever design, I know for certain is not gonna be the correct thing. I need to iterate on it, refine it, and get feedback and, and sort of get it to that point where it then feels simple and it's easy. I'll tell you another little story because as a consultant at Lean Dog where many clients would walk in and they would say, I want to make such and such application and we we're going to be like apple and we're going to be like amazon and we're going to be like visa or twitter or you know insert any giant brand and you know their budgets were often usually very very small and i always referred them over to this sort of great example there's a fantastic wired article about disney and the magic bands and as i've told this story many times i realize i have to actually explain the magic bands i've assumed that many people know what they are so if you do know what they are awesome but for those of you who don't the magic bands are a um a, way, a mechanism for you to tour the disney world parks um, and it contains your credit card information it's your hotel room key um, you can go swimming with it. You can walk up and you can do the, a fast pass to get in line and, and shorten your time on a ride. You can go into a restaurant at Disney World and pay for your Coca-Cola or your, your dinner or your snack or you, you want to get a picture with your kids with Mickey Mouse. You, like, it's all bound up in this band. Um, and the reason why Disney came up with this band is they said, how can we make our place more magical? Our mantra is we are the most magical place on earth, but how do we make it more magical? How do we remove the friction points within our park experience so that people truly find it magical? And so they set off to do what ultimately became the magic bands. And they set up on their main street at Disney World with a few people forming a cross-functional team. And the, that little cross-functional team started studying the people, the flow of people, what their pain points were. They were able to interview people. They were able to prototype and they were testing. And the long and short of it, though, is it didn't happen overnight. It took Disney years to get the magic band. It took thousands of people ultimately to form that team to make magic bands become a reality. And it also took the, uh, Disney a billion dollars to bring to market. Now the genius of the Disney magic bands is that Disney was able to take all of the credit card transactions that would normally happen in the course of a day for a customer. And instead of doing them each time and paying a, uh, you know, a credit card service fee, they reduced it to one payment that goes through at the very end of the day. So just by reducing the payment transactions down to one, say like probably paid for this project, right? Like, I mean, that to me is mind blowing. Like not only did they make something that 
made their customers have a more magical experience and a more delightful time is it actually made a significant operations impact. So key takeaway is magic. Magic takes a little bit of time and a bit of money, um, but it is possible and it's done by studying people. So I'm gonna move into design thinking. Um, I also wanna sort of make sure I'm sort of keeping track of time here. Um, so I'm gonna move into design thinking and then um, I'm gonna share some practical tips with you that hopefully you can use in your work and then we'll open it up for questions. So a lot of times, uh, depending on where, where you work, I suppose, a lot of us spend our time in this uh, column on the left, which is the day-to-day, -day, data, sorry, my dogs, uh, the day-to-day -day management where we're working through sort of known problems. Um, we have clear objectives. We're just trying to make sort of exist, existing things better. Versus when you're working in a design thinking mode, the, the problem's not known. It's fuzzy. It's murky. There's unknown outcomes. You're working with a cross-functional team. You, you know, the solutions um, aren't right there in front of you. There's no real constraints. You've got to explore. So there's sort of two modes, and some people are very comfortable in both worlds. Most folks are comfortable in one or the other. Um, personally, I like to, to be on the design thinking side of things. Um, I can move over to the day-to-day -day management, uh, but if you ask me to sling spreadsheets all day, I'll be very sad. Um, so this is what design thinking feels like. In the early days when I'm starting a project and a problem, it feels like this giant tangle of knots and a giant squiggle of like, I don't know where to go. I don't know where to get started. And you just start taking steps and start untangling and learning and then letting those learnings influence where you go next. And so in those early, early days, things will feel chaotic and that's okay. It's about exploring the problem from different lenses and different angles to try to find over time where those solutions may be and what those solutions are um, and which ones of those might be the most interesting to pursue. And over time, of course, it gets more towards the operational side where things get more known and you can start to move in a more linear fashion. But know that this is what design thinking often feels like. And it's really this iterative process of short feedback loops, trying to understand the people, trying to challenge the assumptions that you have yourself, um, your stakeholders may have, challenge assumptions you're, even your customers might have to try to redefine your problem or what that problem is that you're trying to solve. And here's a diagram. I believe it came from IXDA. Um, I apologize for not noting uh, the source. But while this looks very linear, it's a very nonlinear process. At first, it's like trying to understand the people, empathize with them, understand their problems, their needs, their motivations, and, and the why behind things. And then you start to define some things. And you ideate, and you prototype, and you test. But you might not always, you know, once you get to ideation, you might be like, well, let's test this a little bit. And then you might go back to say, oh, we don't know enough. We got to go back and talk to more people. So we're going to go back to empathize. And then we're going to define a little more. Well, maybe now we know something, we can prototype something. So it's this very, you know, loopy um, process to, to go through, but you're really trying to work through all of these, these stages. Empathy, define, ideate, prototype, and test. You don't want to jump to the solution. So I told you that I teach um, the students in the EMBA program at, at Case. And so last semester, I had a lot of folks who were um, from the Cleveland Clinic. And they uh, were, most of them were physicians, certainly medical, clinical people. Um, and they were like, well, I'll just look at the data. And then we, we're done. We'll, we'll solve it. And I was like, no, no, no. We got to step back. Data will be a key piece of what we're trying to to fit into our learnings, but let's not jump right away to the solution, let's step back. And we need to look at the problem from different perspectives because by looking at it from different perspectives, we may uncover something we had never thought of. And I'll share one of the stories from one of my students and that is through that looking at things from a different perspective and not jumping to a solution, you're able to reframe the problem. So one of my students really wanted to increase the amount of patient check-ins um, at the check-in kiosk. And her immediate solution was, I just need more tablets. 
and I'll put more technology in this space and people will use it more. And I said, no, let's step back. Let's consider different angles. And so through this design thinking process and doing this iteration of like stepping back, learning and understanding all of the pieces that were going on, she was able to recognize and realize that it wasn't a problem with technology. It was actually this, how the space was designed. So she discovered that the kiosks were shoved to the corners of the rooms in the dark corners, right? And the, the desk that said, come check in here and talk to a person was front and center. So it's like, okay, well, could she redesign that space and put the kiosks front and center and move the people to the sides uh, to increase the, the, the check-in at the kiosks? And she was like, yeah, I can. And I don't need any money to move things around. So in the end, she found a great solution. Um, but it was a space design issue. And in the end, she found out she could do it without any money. It just, you know, when, when you're buying for, for capital, that, that's a good thing. Uh, but she never would have gotten there without sort of stepping back and looking at that problem of how do I increase people's check-in at the kiosk from all these different angles. So one of the things I think is a secret sauce to great teams and great work uh, these days is this combination of design thinking where you're exploring the problem, lean as a concept where you wanna build the right things with the least, like the simplest thing with the least amount of waste um, and agile, which is like building the thing in the right way, um, which is more on the process and the ritual side of things. And probably all of these things could be separate talks to you as an organization if that is of interest. Um, but it's really the three of these things that are what allows my teams to do great work together and to deliver great products. And we're always questioning if there's a better way. Can we find a better way to improve ourselves, to improve our process? Um, like, let's not take the status quo as acceptable. Let's challenge it and see how we can get better and get better together. So I'll give you some tips. Uh, for whatever you're designing, you want to get to your core value right away. I mentioned at the very start, I had a startup and we, um, we assembled, we got together, we built an app, we launched our app, we got users, we got funding, and ultimately we ran out of funding. Um, and what is clear to me in hindsight is that we had sort of lost, um, lost sight of our core value of what we were delivering for our app. And so our app was trying to replace the paper business card. And what had happened before we even launched was we spent all this time and effort thinking about onboarding, a tutorial, like creating accounts, all this stuff that a user had to do up front before they could even get in and actually create their first card. Um, and so in hindsight, I wished we had just launched something that was super simple, didn't require an account, and just said, hey, create a card and share it with someone, text it to someone, right? That was a core thing that our early adopters started using. And I wish I had launched that and learned that sooner. Because then I would have, that would have changed sort of the other features that I ended up developing. So while it's easy to get seduced by thinking, oh, I got to start with the front page. I got to start with the front door of creating an account. No, most of the time you don't. Like set that aside, find a way to like just get to the thing that you're trying to do and do that well. You know, nothing exciting has been happening with login and account creation in a long time. That's not what your product is. So just get to your core value and get there right away. Um, Create one clear action, make it super simple that people know what button they're supposed to hit to go next. Um, you often have a secondary button that might be like cancel, um, but you can treat that in a little different style so that it is not calling out from a visual hierarchy the main importance. So make one clear action so your users will find it. Because one of the things I've learned in 20 years is no one will read anything. Um, you've got to make it simple, clear, and concise, and scannable. So I often tell people as you try to work on the wording of things, think about how you would explain it to an eight-year-old. Um, so if you can get it down super simple in very short amount of words, greater chance it can be scanned and it can be read, read at a glance. Um, um, but yes, I've had... I've had studies where we've even used eye trackers, where we watch where people's eyes go, and people will tell you they've read something, and you're like, no, you did not. I saw your eyes did not go where that message was that we were asking about. So know that no one reads. And you'll want to design for the least cognitive load. So similar to like trying to make things understandable to an eight-year-old, um, 
in this example here that I, I've shown is back for my, my business card app, we learned that one of our early adopters were high-end retail people. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to follow up with their customers, but it wasn't important for them to think about like following up like on a specific date. It's more like, I wanna follow up in a month, tomorrow. So having this little reminder feature of letting them select when they'd like the reminder was like framing it around the least cognitive load. It's much easier for me to think about, remind me tomorrow than to wonder in our current situation where everything's a blur, like what on earth day is tomorrow? Like, is it Friday? I, I don't know. Am I on Thursday? <laughs> what happened to August? Am I in September already? What year am I in, right? So design for the least cognitive load. Give everything breathing room. White space makes it easier to consume. I think you as a group of, uh, as a group probably know this, right? But white space is your friends. You don't wanna cram everything in. You wanna make it so that people can sort of feel a little bit of breathing room so that it invites them in to sort of consume <coughs> what it is you've created. Um, now, there's a, a, a reverse of this is too much white space does make people untethered. So you have to remember your form factors that you are designing for. And so I'll speak from a digi digital side. I've got to consider the smallest screen size, which is mobile phone. And I also have to consider that someone might have it on their 56 inch TV. And if I don't give some bounds to like my page structure from a web app perspective, um, and if it's all white, it'll, it'll feel like they're lost. They have nothing to grab onto you. So it's a balance. White space in general though is a good thing. And the words you use matter. So for many of us in our industries, it's easy to get bogged down in sort of what the industry talks about versus thinking about how people think about it. And so many years ago, I used to be a progressive and I left and went and did Lean Dog and the startup and all that jazz. Um, but one of the things for my first time at Progressive was I worked on the servicing application. And we had this question that was, should this person be named the second named insured? And people would never know how to answer this question. And so they were like, well, why not, right? Um, but the reality was, is you could only have one second named insured on the policy. That second named insured was automatically named if it was your spouse. And if you change the second named insured, it required signatures. And if signatures were not gathered, all sorts of bad things happened, right? So we finally did all sorts of testing. I don't believe that Progressive has actually implemented this, but we changed the wording to what it really meant. Right, so for us as designers working with an insurance, we, we knew it as second named insured. But to the customer, that meant nothing. What it really boiled down to was, can this person cancel the policy? And once we put that in front of people, they were like, well, no, no, my 16 year old son should not be able to cancel the policy, right? So step back, I know it's really easy to get trapped in sort of like the business world that we're in, but like, think about it. Like think, how do people really understand it. And again, back to like trying to explain it to an eight-year-old, right? Which one of these is there, are they going to understand better? So your words matter. Try to instill confidence and help users recover easily. A lot of my job is to worry about all the things that can go wrong um, and hopefully that make, the, make that recovery of when things go wrong seamless and that you're able to get back on track. Um, so I worked on a household robot years ago and we had this message where there were situations where the robot would need help. The robot could escape, it could flip over, um, but basically we needed to say, come help me. And since many people anthropomorphized the robot into thinking it was like a pet, we took the approach of speaking and saying, help me. Well, when we tested this with users, people completely freaked out and they're like, I'm at work. Is this robot like chasing the neighbor's dog down the street? Like, oh my God, I can't leave, I can't go home. I like, oh, it created all this anxiety. So we did a few iterations and we finally settled in. I'm like, hey, I can't do my job right now. When you have a minute, just come find me, right? So just letting them know something happened. The robot literally can't work because it's flipped over. Um, and when the user goes to find the robot, they will see what needs to happen, right? Turn that robot back over. So try to instill confidence and help users. And again, this is a good example of words matter, right? Um, try to solve things in the simplest way. Um, I had another client that wanted to build a mobile, again, mobile app, uh, where they, what they really wanted was there, they had a whole group of consultants who did all this work. And what they wanted to know was when the consultant was done with the job, because once the consultant was done with the job, that company could then bill for that work and everybody could get paid. And so they're like, we need a mobile app for them to tell us that they're done. 
I was like, no, we don't need a mobile app. That, uh, they don't want another thing on their phones. Well, we did by talking to people and understanding that they were out and about, they weren't on their computers all the time, they had their phones with them all the time, but they didn't need a mobile app. They just needed an HTML email that was like, hey, are you done? If you are, push this button, right? And then that button could send the, the mark to the system that says, okay, trigger off to accounting and make the bills all, you know, all that billing stuff happen. So sometimes stepping back, looking at it and trying to solve it in the simplest way is certainly a huge saver. So for that client, they didn't spend $100,000 on an app that nobody might use. They spent I don't, uh, hardly anything, a week's worth of time to build an HTML email. So keep people first. Don't do things for the sake of technology. Don't do it because you're like, wow, this is the latest and greatest um, technology I really want to use. Just try to figure out what people need and, and, and keep them at the forefront. So in that prior example, right, we didn't need a sexy mobile app. We just needed an email. Um, when you can for users, leverage what you know about them and, and do it for them. People, while they don't read, they're also very lazy. They don't want to enter a whole lot of stuff. So if you can know anything and pre-fill stuff without being creepy, like you probably shouldn't pre-fill a social security number, but you might be able to pre-fill a zip code or a you know, geographic location. Um, so anything that you can know about the users, do it for them. And look for friction points, remove them, reduce those barriers. So back to the, the tablets uh, um, in the kiosk at the, at the check-in for the clinic, you know, just moving the kiosk, that reduced a barrier. It made it clear, this is where you start. Your design should speak without color. Um, contrast is really important for accessibility. Um, so before you sort of layer on that last bit of like how good things look in your perfect color palette, um, make sure that your designs are strong and can speak without that color because for someone who can't see color, this is important. And it's, it, and it's cousin here is don't rely on color alone. Always have a section, secondary indicator. So oftentimes error messages want to be red, literally, the color red. Um, but if you don't have another symbol maybe with it that calls out that this is something to pay attention to, someone who's colorblind might not see that, right? Um, so don't rely on color. Always have something to support it. Your form fields should have labels outside of the fields. They certainly can start inside, but don't make them disappear once they, the user is in the field because then they're wondering what field am I in. Um, so make sure your form fields have labels. And um, for any of sort of the web and digital designs, you want to remember empty states. And these are the things that are like the very first time somebody comes through and uses your app. So back to my, my, my startup, I had a situation where the user would come in and they had to create their first card. But I could treat that first time experience very differently than the second time they came in after they've already created the card. Um, so you can be really thoughtful about considering that first time use where things might be empty, they haven't taken an action just yet, um, to nudge them to do the thing that you want them to do. Um, I know probably for this group, good visual hierarchies may be, may be known. Um, you know, make sure you've got a clear heading and, and, and things follow in a, in a right order um, and just a good strong hierarchy of information. And then design for 80% you shouldn't have to worry about the extreme edge cases most of the time. Um, in the case with my startup, we had a, a weird edge case where people recycle their phone numbers and we could have had somebody come in and create an account and then recycle their phone. And then somebody who got the new phone number uh, would also come in and create an account. And then we might be accidentally showing that second account the first person's accounts information. And I was like, oh my God, like I need to launch before I even worry about this case. Like I need users before I have to worry about the 4% of people in the world who might recycle their phone number. So that is an example of an extreme edge case, one that we needed to be aware of, but one that I didn't have to design for on day one. Um, the good news, uh, right? There's examples of thoughtful design all around us. There's also examples of really awful design. We've all encountered them. Um, but, you know, be, take inspiration from others. And some books and links. I will share this deck uh, with Spike. I'm sure he will share it out uh, to the whole group. But here are some books and links that will help you um, that I have found particularly helpful in my, um, in my career and that I like. Um, there's certainly some books you read and you're like, bah, that wasn't awesome. But um, so these are books. And... Um, I want to keep going here and move into, I know that was a fire hose of information, but
but to answer any questions. Um, hi, Nicole. <clears throat> hi, Heidi. I think I met you once before. Mm -hmm. um, how do you convince people not to take the first solution? <laughs> um, I really challenge them to say, um, you know, like, let's explore because we could find a better, better solution. Um, we also likely if people come in with a solution already, I'm going to guess they really don't have any um, close insights to their, their customers um, and their users. So even just a, a simple like pulse check and like reach out, like usually just some small steps start to surface out like, hey, maybe you do a survey to customers or you look through customer support issues. Um, like, okay, these are the things we're hearing. Let's talk to some people and let's understand. Um, and oftentimes it's sort of like money, right? Like, I mean, you, sure, I can build you an app for, to stop you and your brother from drunk tweeting, but like, really, do you want to spend that much money? Um, I mean, if you do, like, fine, but um, like, I think maybe we should think back of like, you know, and that's, I know a super silly example, but in that particular case, these two brothers had a mechanism that was actually more valuable of helping parents of teens with getting um, sort of starting their identities with social media and monitoring them. Um, so I was like, here's a whole business opportunity, right? Um, like, let's maybe pursue this, but and before we like build it, let's like understand what's actually needed. I, don't know, I think there are politicians who might be able to use that particular app. Mm -hmm. I yep, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw out something. Have you ever heard of the podcast 99% Invisible? I have. I don't listen to all that many podcasts, but I have heard of it. That one's wonderful. It talks about how good design is, is mostly invisible. People don't notice it. You notice it when it was, when it's bad, when something gets in your way. But there was another, there was one story, and I think it was just a small story. You were talking about testing with, don't just test with your family. Um, years after they invented these faucets that, that you stick your hands under and, and they, they, it starts pouring water, they found out that they were racist because everybody who tested it was white. And when they brought in people with darker, darker colored skin, it didn't activate those faucets. So that caused a lot of stuff to have to change. Yeah, and that's an important thing. Like make sure you're getting, sorry, my dog's going bananas. Um, you wanna make sure that you have a diverse group of people. You, I mean, the same, the same issue happened with the crash test dummies that were built for men, right? Um, so you wanna make sure that you have a good sampling of, of your customers, your ages, their abilities, um, you know, you know, whatever the ethnicity or perhaps socioeconomic standpoints, um, you know, every, every situation or a company is sort of maybe different on what their, their customer is, but make sure you're, you're making it diverse. There's no reason not to these days. Like okay. when you make things inclusive uh, and design for that inclusivity, we all win, right? The other example used is the curb cuts in the sidewalks, right? Which were put in for accessibility for people's, in wheelchairs to be able to get up onto the sidewalk. Well, as a parent with a stroller, that really helps me out too, right? Mm -hmm. um, or the, even the, you know, the automatic faucets or the, I mean, now given COVID, like I'm like, I love places that have automatic doors, right? That just open and I'm like, oh, thank God I don't have to touch anything. Um, so we all win when we try to really include, um, you know, the, the, the people who are different than us. Um, I will also say as a designer of software that I am the worst possible tester of my own designs. Um, and normally I'm more back end than front end, but still, because I know what's supposed to happen. And I, I always test it the way I think it's supposed to work. And then you bring somebody else in and then you're, you're shocked and, and, and it finally occurs to you, oh, this is what a normal person would, would think of when they look at something. I always find, um, and that's sort of like to that slide, right? Like you and I don't have the answers and we got to like understand the people and test with people. Is that even if I think this is finally an awesome design and I put it in front of people, I'm always humbled by what is uncovered. You'll always learn something. 
Um, and it's really great if you work in teams that you bring your teams along with you bec or to, to Heidi's question about like people glomming onto the, the solution is like when you have stakeholders who or developers, it, like anyone on your team, like seeing people use it, seeing it in action is, is one of those powerful pieces where they all of a sudden have a whole lot of empathy. They understand what you're doing and they like, right, we're in this together to make a great product. Um, and there's always, there's always something to learn. What do you think is the best education for a career in user experience? Like what's <laughs> the one must have or what would get you hired um, if you have a traditional background? So when I used to do oh. hiring, I was always looking for people who could take me through the problem that they were solving, understand the process that they went through. Um, you know, it's okay if you like created something and it failed, like that's learning too, right? But like, take me through like, what was this problem? how did you know it was a problem? What did you learn along the way? What were your contributions um, making? And what was the outcome? What, what, what was the impact? Um, so I always ask that of the people applying to like understand more of their thought processes. Now it depended on where I worked as to where where I needed people to fall in sort of UX is a very broad thing. And I get, I get forgot to include it in the slide. There's, if you look it up, there's UX umbrella. Um, and that sort of covers like it's interaction design, it's content strategy, it's information architecture, user research, right? And so if you have a, a large company, you might be very specialized. So at Progressive, there are people who just do research, right? Um, but there are also designers and there are graphic designers and there are visual designers and there's content strategists. Um, but when I was at Lean Dog, I couldn't afford to have all those people. I had to find the people who had sort of all those skills in one. And for me, when I was at Lean Dog, um, it was important that those designers came to me with a strong design aesthetic because at the end of the day, we were the designers making those icons and making the interaction design, like the design. Um, and so that to me is like the hard one to teach. Like you sort of have it or you don't. Like you have a good design aesthetic or you don't. Um, sure, you can go to art school, but like it might be that feels like the one thing that's harder to overcome versus learning how to do great information architecture or thinking about creating the content strategy, um, learning how to do user research. Those to me feel like totally approachable um, that anyone can learn. And there's tons of books to dig into. There's tons of things these days online, um, you know, whether that's through Udemy or, you know, General Assembly. I mean, heck, I'm sure there's probably TikTok videos these days that I'm just maybe too old for, but um, right, that there, there's so much out there to get started. But I think it all depends on where you're sort of looking for that role, uh, what they may need in those, pers the, those people. And unfortunately for this role, the thing I did not mention all along is that a lot of companies want this unicorn where they want someone who can write the front end uh, code, who can sling jQuery, who can do user research, who can do visual design, like uh, who knows content strategy mapping backwards and forwards. Um, and I'm like, okay, those people exist, but they're not coming at you for a junior level salary. Be prepared <laughs> to pony up. I mean, like you're talking like, multiple six figures, right? Uh, if you want that in one person versus like stepping back and looking like one, those job descriptions tell me you don't know what the heck UX is. Two, you're asking for like three people in one, so you should probably just put three job descriptions out there. And if your budget can only handle one of those, pick which one's gonna move you the furthest like now. Um, so anyhow, like, so as you look for these jobs, be aware, like some of them will be like, the descriptions will be completely ridiculous. I have a question for you from the chat, and then I have one. I have a, some questions from after that, but this is from Judy Beveridge. How do you deal with acronyms? They, I feel like they're every, they're everywhere. So <laughs> what, what's the? So there's a question for you. Um, I prefer to be clear and avoid acronyms. Um, and I, as I say that, right, like UX is an acronym. Um, and I mean, these days I've actually shifted instead of saying UX because I feel like. It's not, while I might have it in my title, it's really the responsibility of the whole team. So I'd rather take the title of product design. Um, but acronyms in general, like wherever you work, like everybody's got them. Um, and it's really awful when you're like, hey, new person on the team, here's our cheat sheet of all the acronyms that go on in this place. Um, over time, sure, you'll learn them and you'll use them yourself, but like, God, I wish they would go away. Oh, all right, go ahead, Karen. You can you can go before me. 
Um, if this is off track, we can save it for later. But Nicole, I was interested in the part of your job that you say you um, talk about um, projecting into the future. And I know you can't talk specifics about your job, but can you say anything about what you see for the future of UX design? Absolutely. I, there's sort of two pieces to that. So for, for my work that I do at Progressive, it's like reimagining things. Like if we, if you had totally blue sky and you could do things and you weren't constrained, would you do things differently? How might that shift and change? And given trends, like, you know, I mean, I think a trend is like there's autonomous vehicles coming at some point in our lives. And what happens when there's autonomous vehicles? And so this is not an example of a project we're working on, but certainly something you would say, I think car insurance company would be thinking about, right? Is like, what happens is there's fewer drivers. So what does insurance look like? Um, so like, you've got to sort of question those things and thinking about there's trends that are coming for the business. COVID, for example, is disrupting all sorts of businesses to rethink their models, to rethink can people work from home? Um, and what does that mean when the people are home or if they are in the office, what's that like? Right, like, so there's like, right now, I think we're in a really interesting like forced innovation. It's forced people to like, like everybody has had to get online. My mother has had to get comfortable with FaceTime, right? Like, cause she can't see her, her, her grandchildren, right? Like we had to get her, get her to that point. Um, now, as far as UX goes though, I think there's a lot that's on the horizon that's really interesting, right? The screens are disappearing. It's more and more sensors that are coming online. And so it's this orchestration of these things that are being read. What happens when the screen is like minority port and it's in your reality? You know, how do you design for that? How do you design for that happening and still being like walking at the same time? Um, what happens when, when things are sounds? Um, right, we have now smart devices that we wear on our wear on our bodies, and so how do you provide feedback um, in a balanced way so it's not like irritating, but like it gives a signal? Or do you have technology that's like bioluminescent threads that like flare up because it protects you as you're as you're running or biking, and so people can see you at night? Um, like all of those things are things we as designers have to start to think about. That it's only going to accelerate like. Think screens are getting smaller um, and the screen is disappearing. And as it disappears, it's somewhat that interaction is being pushed into our environments. Um, and when that happens, like, what's that like? What happens when you have a smart stove or refrigerator that orders you groceries automatically? You know, that to me is exciting. Thank you, cool. So that got a little bit into my question, but not exactly. But I also, you reminded me, Nicole, of a book that I really like. I stayed up all night reading. Well, it wasn't, it took more than one night, but it was a, it was um, called Creative Selection. And it was about the development of the original soft keyboard on the iPhone and the whole process of how that happened. And it was kind of like um, all the design process of user experience, but it also had to do the, all the politics and, and drama with like moving an organization and developing a product. It was really fascinating. For so, sure. so, so that, I just thought that was amazing. So the, what, where does speech and augmented reality and like LIDAR, LIDAR cameras all fit into user, I guess the user experience. I mean, I guess you talked about that a little bit from Karen's question for the Yeah, yeah those are future. technologies that just sort of slip, slip my, my mind as I was talking about it, but absolutely those are becoming more and more pervasive. The technology is getting better the cost to do those things is getting cheaper. So as, right, like as the cost to develop augmented reality, as an example, gets cheaper, more and more do it. And so where I think those sorts of um, app, like real world applications are, are probably in manufacturing where you might have, you know, instructions in a, somebody's, um, you know, helmet that they're wearing, like if they're a welder, let's say, do they have like a virtual augmented reality that is helping guide them through the, the, the work that they're doing? Um, and so absolutely, that's another experience. They've got like hot welding stuff in their hands and the screen and they're trying to do, so how, how does that work? And is it augmented with a sound? Like do things speak to you? Um, so it, it is one of those, I don't have an answer on how to design for it, but that is the next set of design challenges that are coming. 
And it's, it, it's, it's like, I think when I first thought of like, oh, augmented reality feels like it's stuck in the gaming world, but that feels like actually not the main market for it. I think the main market is an in industry. Go, go ahead, Heidi. Oh, I'm just oh. listening. <laughs> are, they, are there any other questions? Oh, all right, Henry, go ahead. Uh, look at the chat. Um, oh, I got to maybe put it on my big screen so I can actually read it. It's all good. The last two questions. As you get older, my eyes are getting worse. Uh, <laughs> There's an RUI right there. That's why we're going with bigger phone. Henry, Henry why don't you just read them to her so she doesn't have to find them? Well, can you make a copy of your presentations as a PDF so that uh, our attendees can get a copy of them? And for those who weren't able to make it to tonight's meeting, um, I tried to take as many notes as possible and create a rough outline. If you look in a chat box. You did a fantastic job, I, was, I have to say. <laughs> I was trying to keep up. So um, a lot of them were the same terms that we used during our industrial design program. So it was pretty straightforward. You pretty much mapped out the same workflow we had for pretty much design basics. Yeah. Uh, as far as testing, making sure everything worked, the workflow. So that it was like basically rehashing the entire industrial design design process, you know, to right. the end user, which um, is really, really good. It's, I mean, it's a design process. You can apply it to exactly. anything, right? Like you, if you have a meeting that you hate going to, like redesign it. Right. right? Take, the same, take the same approach. It doesn't have to be software. Um, I think that's the key with the design thinking side of things is right. It's that process isn't agnostic to like just the UX world. It's like, it's about approaching it with a design lens. Sure. Um, it applies to products, uh, graphic design, typography. I mean, pretty much everything, but it's the same core concept. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. I will make a PDF. That was my intent. Um, and uh, before I do that, I will add my email to that. Um, but it's super simple. It's uh, my name, Nicole.Capuana, C as in cat, A as in apple, P as in people, U-A-N-A -A at gmail.com. You can certainly find me on LinkedIn. I did mention I'm always happy to have conversations with folks like Heidi can attest to. I met her years ago when I was at Lean Dog and I think she came to a meetup and then she was like, can I talk to you some more? And she came down and we had a little chat or she stayed longer. I can't remember. It's a few years ago, right? But Happy to, happy to chat um, with anyone. Um, and then, so your other question that is like, do I have any formal training? Um, and no, no, I don't. Um, I was leaving college. Well, when I went to college and got a classics degree. Um, so I was the one and only major for my year with a classics degree. Didn't know what the heck I would do with that. So I took a road trip to Seattle and literally when I was graduating uh, college, the internet was happening. Like, so I got to Seattle and that whole dot com boom and then bust. Um, but you pretty much everybody ended up in technology. So my my training really has just been like as it's grown over time. Like my very first job, I think, was webmaster, right? And I do know HTML and CSS, not that you want it in production these days. Um, but that was my starting point was to learn coding. Um, and then over time, it's just, I was more interested in like the design of things, how things interacted and how they worked. And then the people side of it, how do we have the, like it really, a lot of my job is like psychology, right? Trying to dig into what people need and why and asking these questions to sort of pull these out and then being able to take these insights and, and formulate them into something like, well, what might we build from this? Like, um, so long story short is no, I don't have a formal training. The good news is these days for young folks, um, or career changers, um, there are plenty of programs that are more formalized these days um, where Kent State has a great master's program in, um, I think it was called Knowledge Management and Information Architecture. I believe it got rebranded as UX lately. Um, it's a great program, it's master's level. There's plenty of online boot camps you could do, um, you know, they, obviously you're paying boot camp prices for. And some of these things, I think you just, it's reading and trial and error and trying to apply it and then seeing um, how that makes makes a difference. And, and yeah, I mean, I, you look, I look back at things I've designed, right? And you're like, oh God, that was awful. But like, you know, it was good for the time. Um, and I learned from that. And I learned that, um, you know, one example of something that I look back on and like cringe is like, we had these messages my first time at Progressive that were the, um, basically like, if you don't do something, something's gonna happen. You're either gonna like cancel, your, your policy will get canceled or your rates are gonna change. Neither are good experiences, right? Um, 
but we, I got, I let the business person drive the wording of these messages and they were so complicated. We literally had 12 messages to say, hey, we think we have the envelope that you mailed us and it may or may not contain a check with the right amount on it. So please, if you haven't paid the correct amount, please make a payment, right? Like we had 12 of these, I don't even know how they inquired correctly, right? When at the end of the day, it's like the poor person just needed to know like, make a payment, right? Like you are, if you don't pay, your policy is canceling, you will have no insurance, right? Like. Um, so I look back and I'm like, oh God, I wish, I wish I had fought for, at the time for better wording of those messages. I wish I had fought for like, can we just have one make a payment message instead of these like 24 variations that could show up if we received the envelope in the mailroom? Um, so anyhow, but I learned, right? And I learned that um, I had to push back and get more confident as a designer and say like, I'm championing for the user business person. You are too wordy. Um, let's test these messages. <laughs> let's find this and let's create a strategy around these messaging, right? But that, that helped me learn and grow as a designer. So you're basically an interpreter for lawyers, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fighting lawyers right now who want me to say way too much. And I'm like, nobody's going to read this. Mm, right. no one's gonna read it. <laughs> I know they're not going to read it. So can we just say, I, whatever, I agree. <laughs> but they're like, no, no, you have to show the whole thing. No. Maybe you should give a course to the entire Congress right now on how to simplify, uh, how they uh, disseminate information. Yeah. The good news, I mean, I, this is not going to happen and change overnight. The good news is that the federal government uh, does have two agencies within it. One is called the United States Digital Service and the other is a more agency model and that's called 18F. And so these two groups are there to help all the government agencies make things better, more approachable, more accessible and better design. And so I think their very first thing was like helping veterans um, get signed up for their VA insurance, um, which before was like super complicated. and. Right, but there, there's opportunity abounds within governments, right? Um, but the fact that they have now employed these two groups and the USDS being the larger of the two, um, they're there to serve all of those agencies and make things better. 18F is sort of like a loan in agency where special projects can call them in and say, hey, we want you as like a consultant, like, right, you know, I'm gonna hire you in to do a little bit of work and then we're gonna continue. But um, so that's the good news. It's just going to take some time because there's so many things to fix. All right. So, Nicole, thank you very much for presenting to us. I, I really enjoyed your program and I, we were grateful of you giving up part of your evening for us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me.